Yes, um, I found it very interesting uh, what you said in your lecture about uh, trying to form or find a new vernacular. Um, but I think uh, one should add that, of course, that was not the first uh, try to do so. And not for nothing, the like Paul Strand drew heavily, for example, on Walt Whitman. And uh, if you see on the visual uh, level, maybe even the Hudson River School, um, they were just um, remembering that there were um, the, the, uh, in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, uh, there was this first try to f form a nation via the media, be it uh, in word, like Walt Whitman's uh, Leaves of Grass or the Hudson School there. And I think they borrow a lot uh, from these people. I found, for example, the commentary, the poetic commentary, which I found beautiful, uh, owes a lot to Walt Whitman's uh, Leaves of Grass uh, in, in that content. No, you're absolutely right. And I think the different two things. One, Walt, Whit Walt Whitman is clearly the reference here. And there's a sense in which Whitman's project, uh, Whitman is, I think in American literary terms, probably the key modernist uh, uh, poet. And he's resuscitated in a very strong way at the uh, beginning of the 20s. And the film that, uh, that Paul Strand worked on with Charles Sheeler, um, Manhattan, of, of explicitly uh, repositions um, Whitman. And of course, yeah, the, the luminists, et cetera. There, there is, a, of course, a tradition of an American vernacular. The difference here is the, the sense in which it's cross-platform, cross the sense in which, uh, number one, it has government agency behind it, sort of selecting what that vernacular will be and selectively uh, promoting it. And number two, making sure that this imagistic form, this imagistic style, is not limited to the world of high art, as it was, say, with the Luminists, but rather that it's, it boils down to a kind of democratic level, that it shows up in uh, the, the kinds of um, photo essays that the government uh, stimulated the production of, that it shows up in film form, um, that it shows up in projects. What the government had at its disposal, thanks to this Works Project Administration, were thousands of intellectuals and artists who they could, in a sense, put to work going out and collecting folk music, going out and, and sort of putting together anthologies of, of American literature, going out and documenting in a very particular way, photographically, these, uh, this, um, you know, this, the state of America. So it's that project of, of uh, formalizing a vernacular, I guess, that, that makes the difference here. But you're absolutely right. There has, of course, been a long tradition of uh, American difference um, in aesthetic production. Yeah. Was there, is there something? Yes, um, um, Bill, you made a very good case uh, both for the 30s being crucial in uh, defining modern America and also your emphasis on the land. Uh, nonetheless, I feel for the reasons you've given, you know, your own background at NYU, you're, you're extraordinarily generous to, to uh, this moment in, in some specific ways because you're talking about the land, as you say, as the basis for Para Lawrence's vision of America. But of course, the thing that uh, is totally missing is land ownership. And um, it's very striking how a consensus is built in, in this film, in particular around the, uh, the, the pronoun we. We made the war, uh, we overfarmed, we had to leave for the West. Now, uh, uh, today, of course, that kind of we is inconceivable, absolutely inconceivable. And uh, the, the, the poetry. Uh, things that people always mention about the, the different trees and uh, the different rivers. And I was just thinking while, while, while I was watching it again what this film would be like if instead of the, uh, the names of all the rivers you had the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, uh, the Vanderbilts. <laughs> um, and that would, uh, you know, that's just you know, slightly uh, polemical to indicate what other lists one could make in sure. order to uh, uh, create a sense of, of America in, in, in the 30s. Uh, that's w one, one issue. I'm not, not sure that you want to uh, respond to that because you've actually made very explicit that you were aware of all these political criticisms. Um, but maybe another thing that I could uh, just um, briefly uh, uh, ask you about, and I just said yesterday um, I was making an argument of a slightly different kind. I was looking at uh, uh, not the Paolo Lawrence film, but the flirty films of a little bit later, uh, The Land, and I was comparing it to uh, Grapes of Wrath. And I was arguing that, contrary to 
what uh, we hear and read about and in some sense what you reconfirmed. Um, in, my, in my view, I think that uh, Zanuck and Ford could allow themselves to be much more radical than, than Floherty uh, making a film f for government agencies. Sorry, the last bit that they were, had... They more had radical. Like Politically, uh, Grapes of Wrath is a more radical film than The Land. The, the, con the concessions that The Land has to make sure. to its sponsors are actually greater than Ford had to make towards Sanic and yeah. the box office. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, Ford, of course, has the advantage of being made, of, of making the Grapes of Wrath at a moment when the economy is on the upswing. Um, it's 39, and... The um, land Okay. But by that point, 40, it's, it's late 41, as I recall, and of course, the, um, it's a very crucial period because the economy is on the upswing thanks to war. It's a war-stimulated economy by 39, but by late 41, it's also a very, there's the sort of swing back in terms of national identity thanks to potential engagement <laughs> in war. So I think the notion of playing with national symbols becomes very touchy at moments of, of public reconsolidation and, and war. So I think there the timing is actually quite, 39 you got away, could get away with murder, and 41, 42, th the belt was starting to tighten in terms of um, expressive latitude, uh, potentially, but that's, that's something, only a theory. In terms of the inclusionist we, um, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point, and I think it, it speaks precisely to, to Per Lorenz's agenda here, which was, on the one hand, to point the finger. I mean, he, he tells us here that, you know, he talks about an ever-increasing um, percentage of farmers losing control of their land. He talks about the rise of sharecropping and the fact that these, he gives a few statistics to tell us how many farmers are being, in a sense, disenfranchised. Um, certainly in The Plow That Broke the Plain, he also gives us some numbers about the the fact that land is being taken away. But this film is a remarkably inclusionist film. For example, when you look at how he does this little quick loss of history, and he needs to say that the Civil War was a, was a kind of turning point in a nodal point in terms of land use. And um, how do you reference the Civil War in a way not to alienate either the South or the North? And he's found a very elegant solution using the general of the Southern Army, Lee's uh, surrender speech, which is a poignant and touching speech. He can nod to it, but at the same, he can sort of point to it, but at the same time be quite inclusionist for both southern and northern audiences. So I guess at this, I guess my point is simply that at this moment, A, you know, this would have not have served the, 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 the institutional interests behind the film to start talking about the Rockefellers and the Carnegies. I mean, this is a moment where the, Rock, where the Roosevelt administration is trying to consolidate power. There's an election coming up within a year. So they're definitely not looking to irritate uh, the power brokers in America. But at the same time, I think the film is also quite clear. Maybe it says we, but I know that I wasn't the one that, you know, I think most of us know who owns the lumber and who owns the, uh, the resources, who owns the coal. So I find it, um, again, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a point that we can be critical of or one that we can sort of situate within the discourse of the time, which would suggest that, yeah, this is a soft way of, of making a hard point. Um. I, yeah, I, I just want to follow up on that. I, I, first of all, it, I think it's very important to <clears throat> bear in mind the fact that it's not all we. It's the nation. It's, I mean, it's really interesting, the different, um, the different voices that, uh, that he uses. Also, I only got the microphone so I could say the Wachita, the Wichita, the Yellow, and the Gazoo. Um, uh, and, but the, the, the point about the lists are, to be serious, that there, that they, that there are different voices all the time, aren't there? And, and, and that it, it, it isn't always the um, uh, a we. And in fact, on the contrary, it's, it, it, it is a passive voice. Um, uh, and, th and that's illustrated by the fact that, that Lorenz himself was at odds with, um, with the crew on plough. Um, and there was this terrible, there's a wonderful story in Variety where they, where they were threatening to walk off the picture. Um, and years later, in giving an interview uh, to Colliers, um, uh, Lorenz says, I don't know, they wanted, to make, they wanted to talk about capitalism and I thought it was about a dust storm. Um, which I think sort of sums, sums up the, the fundamental political position, don't you think? Um, and, and, the, and the poetic language, I mean, I think you're right. It's obviously, it is Whitman-esque um, in that sense. And the, and the pictures are, you know, in that 
in that tradition, which I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's um, the seven, but I think it's certainly, you know, um, Adams and, and that particular sort of vibrant um, social realism. But my, my feeling, I suppose my question is that, um, uh, is really to do with the fact that, that um, uh, this didn't work. There was a sort of rhetorical stroke going on in all of those films. There's a wonderful thing. Um, uh, the one that Paul Robeson does the um, commentary for. I'm having another senior moment, so I've forgotten it. Where, where, where he says, "There's a is that beautiful Native Land, is that or? Which one? It was uh, not. Um, it was the one with, um, um, with the dramatic, uh, the 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 agent provocateur as the union organizer, that um, that Hurwitz made. I don't want to say uh, Native Land, but. Uh Yes, it's native land. Of course, it's native land. I'm sorry, I'm really losing. <coughs> um, where he actually, where there's this great sentence about, you know, um, this is happening in a, a, a hundred cities and a thousand towns, all that business. Hundred cities, thousand towns, um, blah blah blah. It's morning in America, which of course, which of course Reagan then uses as a as a campaign slogan. And and, and really, there's a sort of um, it, it, even a right wing um, possibility about that about the exclusivity, uh, the inclusivity of the rhetorics. I think the rhetorics are really very complicated and are, and are far more um, uh, uh, intuitive, if you if you will, in that sense, rather than a, a particular uh, coming from a particular position. And I think it is wrong to actually suggest that there's a there's an inclusive we. Um, and he is a he is a West Virginian. In I've always thought the South bit is because he's a West by God Virginian. So they were in the middle, as it were. Well, it's true. I mean, but I. What I'm hearing is a contradiction because the yeah, inclusivity sure. is there in his look in his naming of locations and cutting across occupations and let's say he takes rather great pains to to sort of paint with a broad uh, with, with a with a with a complex palette. Yet it has the same ambiguity that that the we has for Roosevelt. I mean, the, these fireside chats are actually quite interesting as rhetorical strategies in terms of trying to bind together a very divisive, a, an ideologically polarized nation. Um, and I guess the good news in the American case was it happened to be a somewhat left of center regime doing this as opposed to the German situation where it was, you know, a sort of extreme right uh, position from which to be inclusion. But I, I, I grant you that that in, in, inclusivist strategy is always a quite a dangerous one because it, t it, 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 tends to suppress, uh, it tends to suppress opposition, yeah. And I would say the last question from Herrn Zimmermann. Es ist eigentlich äh, mehr eine Beobachtung, aber vielleicht auch eine Frage an äh, Bill. Um, uh, okay, I speak English. Um, what strikes me is the, um, uh, if I see the films in comparison of the uh, different uh, countries, I have the impression that they have one in common. It's they ignore social differences and construct organism metaphors, like the river, like the coal mining, like the night mail, like blut und boden, like uh, everything else, which shows we are one unity, we are one people, we are one nation. And uh, they ignore, as uh, um, Thomas Elsa had just said, they ignore really the social differences. And I think the films, um, are indeed in the 30 especially, a kind, they take part in a crisis management. The, yeah. after, uh, and, and behind it is the world economic crisis yeah. of the late 20s. The state intervention tries to um, give the nation in every c uh, country, Western country, a new vision. Uh, Roosevelt um, in, in Great Britain too, and uh, in, in Germany with the Nazi party too. And, uh, they um, use in, in, the f in their film language, they, lose, they use a similar, um, they ignore the dialectic of the uh, historical process and they show the organistic uh, community of the people of the Volksgemeinschaft. What do you call Volksgemeinschaft in Germany, Hitler's specific uh, topic? This was in a way international, international propaganda. And that's a big similarity between all these uh, films in comparison, I think. I don't, don't know if you have the same impression, you know the German culture film very well. Yeah, and what I would say, I mean, let's say it, it over from a kind of uh, 
to a kind of sentimentality from a sincere they, from a sincere position to a sentimental position, and that's a that's a, a slide that occurs quite a bit. But if I think of the British case, it's a little bit different because of the language problem. The moment that you start to show people, you're talking about class. In America, it's in a, it's a little more complicated because. Uh, uh, there's accent, there's occupation, there's other markers that aren't necessarily as class-bound as in the British case. Um, and Lorenz evades all that. That's, that's the, the, the genius of these, uh, of these two films. Maybe it's not M.A. or maybe the... Uh, I have a very short and simple question. Who saw those films? I'd like something about the distribution and the reception of those films and even the more left political films in the period. The left political films were seen, um, there was widespread uh, labor activism, at least in the, in the industrial sector, car manufacturing, steel, coal, that sort of stuff. So there, was, there were active circuits to get the films, um, not these films, but the Film and Photo League uh, films, to workers' communities. So workers certainly would have a had access to those films. But I think in terms of an urban public, aside from the organizing activities of the CP, um, there probably was not, they were not widespread. These were shown in the cinema, though. I mean, the, the, the plow that broke the plane eventually cracked the cinema boycott. Part of the problem, I think, was, was a, a sort of antagonistic relation between Lorenz, who, who worked as a film critic, who was extremely critical of Hollywood illusionism and pointedly critical of the Hayes office. So he had had some bad will stored up. But in, eventually, what he did basically was target film critics across the country who recognized him as a critic looked at his film and said, wow, hey, it's not a bad film, and then pressured independent cinemas to, uh, to try to show the film. But the other real problem with these films is their length. They're a little bit too long to easily fit next to a feature and still get in like a newsreel or uh, something else. They, they could, in some, depending on the length of the feature, it could have meant one less showing a night, and that's money, and that's a, a very hard argument to beat. The River, though, was an act of distribution. And part of the trick with these films was because they were government projects, they were given free, but there were apparently contractual difficulties. Um, this film was distributed, in fact, and there were some contractual difficulties in terms of it, on the one hand, being free, but on the other hand, costing money for distribution, et cetera. But the river was widely, was relatively widely seen. These were both pulled from circulation, thanks to the Republicans, by the way, and uh, were, were only, only reemerged sometime in the 1960s after their first round of circulation. Thank you, William Rocchio. Thanks. <laughs>